the journal club, the club members will get together on the third Tuesday every month. The first one will be on July the 15th. Dr. Jennifer Xi and Dr. Kate Lee will lead the discussion. I hope all of you can join this club and please come to share with everyone your brilliant ideas or maybe your fabulous lunch food if you want. And please join and enjoy. Our next lecture also will be the last one in our current series will be by Dr. Uh, Gil Prince. Dr. Prince is one of the pioneers in research on estrogenic compounds like uh, bisphenol A and how those compounds affect the prostate development and function. Uh, I hope to see all of you in this room next month. And again, for those who are watching webcasting, you can send me your comments, questions uh, during the, like, this lecture or afterward to me at my email, lli at oeha at ca.ca.gov. And uh, thank all of you for coming. Now let's welcome Mr. Alan Hirsch, uh, OEHA Chief Deputy Director. Okay, thank you, Ling Hong. Yes, as uh, Ling Hong mentioned, Joan Denton is out this week, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Distinguished Lecture Series today. Uh, uh, Dr. Kevin Guido is a senior investigator and director of the Center for Integrated Genomics at the Hamner Institutes for Health Sciences in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Dr. Guido has conducted numerous studies on the adverse effects of environmental chemicals in the male reproductive system. His research incorporates the use of genomic technologies with in vitro and in vivo models to investigate the endocrine actions of environmental chemicals, such as phthalates. Today, Dr. Guido will present his recent findings in gene pathways that are involved in phthalate-induced testicular dysgenesis. Now, this is actually a very timely issue for, for OEHA and for Cal EPA as a um, whole. In the last five years, OEHA has added five phthalates to the Proposition 65 list, all as reproductive and developmental toxicants. And as many as, as many of you know, the legislature last year passed a bill, AB 1108, that enacted some very tight restrictions on the use of six key phthalates in toys and children's products. OEHA and DTSC analyzed that bill, and we talked about it quite extensively before the governor's decision to sign that bill. We're also nearing the finalization of, of Cal EPA's Green Chemistry Initiative, uh, which is uh, DTSC is taking the lead on that, and they'll be considering broad policies for keeping toxic chemicals out of consumer products. So the scientific work performed by Dr. Guido and others is helping to inform all of these issues. So without further ado, here is Dr. Kevin Guido. Thank you, Alan, for that introduction. And thank you, Ling Hong, for the invitation to be here today. Um, I have really enjoyed uh, my first visit to Sacramento. It's a beautiful city, and I had a great night in, in Old Town, Sacramento. And I was mentioning earlier that the, um, there's been some apologies for the smoky skies, but the smoky skies actually make me feel quite at home. Uh, if you've ever been in North Carolina on a hazy, hot summer day, the skies look pretty much the same. And also, you may not know that we have a large um, fire going on in eastern North Carolina, and there was a couple days last week where we were completely covered in dense smoke as well. So I feel right at home here. And thank you very much. <coughs> So I, as, as mentioned, I'll talk about some of the research I've been doing over the past several years with um, um, uh, phthalate esters. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Hamner Institute. Some of you may not be familiar with that. It's actually a, a relatively new name for our institute. We were formerly the Chemical Industry Institute of Toxicology, or CIIT. <coughs> and um, it, as CIIT, we focus primarily on the mechanisms of chemical-induced toxicity. Um, over the past several years, we've tried to broaden our, 
broaden our focus to um, take a wider look at human health um, um, issues or hu uh, concerns as to human health. So we're not just focusing on chemical toxicity, but we're lo also looking into other areas of, of human health concern. So uh, to sort of signify the fact that we've broadened our research focus, we've changed our name to the Hamner Institute, which is named after Charles Hamner, who was uh, a key person in bring, bringing uh, biotechnology into North Carolina and helping building up the, the biotechnology industry that's there today. So, um, so the, the Hamner Institute now still contains a, a portion of the institute which is known as CIIT, so there's still chemical toxicity research being done there, but it also has a broader focus now with, with other areas of research that, we're, that are ongoing. So what I'd like to talk about today is the work that I've done with, with phthalate research um, over the past several years. And first I'd like to talk about the uh, genomic approach we took um, several years ago in which um, we tried to identify the mechanisms of phthalate um, testicular toxicity taking, um, um, by looking at a, a genome-wide approach. And we did it looking at multiple um, phthalates, some which were considered reproductive toxicants and some which are not, and uh, tried to use that information to gain an understanding of how phthalates are producing their effects. Then we'll talk about, um, a little bit ab about some um, work we did, again, taking a genomics approach uh, using a time course to try to find out what some of the early gene effects were occurring after, um, immediately after um, phthalate exposure. And then um, we'll get into some of our, our oops, excuse me, I'm still getting used to this um, Z type of um, approach here. Um, then we'll get into some of our, our more recent work where we're looking at the, um, um, the, promoter and, uh, the promoters of some of the genes that are regulated are altered in expression following phthalate exposure to try to understand what some of the upstream effects of uh, mechanisms by which phthalates cause their effects. And then finally, I'll talk about some of our um, most recent work. We're, we're doing a species comparison, and we've come up with some surprising results that I want to talk about. So first, um, I probably don't need to, to bring to this group what the public health issue is, but there's been a concern over the past several years of um, increasing incidence of, of male human reproductive disorders, and these um, disorders include um, clipsorchidism, which is undescended testis, hypospadias, which is uh, malformed penis, and see these are two, two of the uh, most common male uh, reproductive birth defects. And there's also concerns about uh, prostate and testicular cancer and reduced male fertility. Uh, several years ago, some scientists who had been studying these uh, multiple different issues came together and proposed a hypothesis known as um, the testicular dysgenesis syndrome hypothesis, in which they hypothesized that all of these uh, different um, male reproductive disorders could actually be explained um, um, if you looked at, if you disrupted male reproductive tract development during fetal life by either chemical exposure or through um, genetic mutation. And um, so they proposed the testicular dysgenesis syndrome um, as something that happens during fetal life to explain effects that show up later in, um, in the male. And what was also happening at the same time is, is multiple laboratories um, around the world were beginning to make observations with a group of chemicals known as antiandrogens. These are chemicals which block male hormone function. And what they found was the um, uh, effect of fetal male um, exposure of fetal male rats to antiandrogens leads to many of the same syndromes that, that are seen in the human population, such as cryptorchidism and hypospadias, and uh, in some cases reduced fertility. <coughs> And just um, from an environmental point of view, an, uh, over the years, an, an, a number, an increasing number of chemicals have been identified which are in the environment which can act as antiandrogens. And this includes um, insecticide metabolites, um, fungicides, herbicides, um, some antifungals, and some organophosphate um, pesticides. And the chemicals that I'll be talking about today are the phthalate esters. Now, what's, in, what's unique about the phthalate esters compared to these other compounds is that these other compounds all produce their antiandrogen effect by um, binding to the androgen receptor and present, preventing the male hormone testosterone from producing its effect. And what I'll show you um, today is that the phthalate esters actually work through a completely different mechanism to produce their antiandrogenic-like effects. So um, just to help us understand why um, male hormone is so important during male reproductive development, I want to talk a little bit about the, the process of male reproductive development. So um, in um, most mammals and in humans, the, um, the gonad, both the male and the female, starts out in the fetal life as an undifferentiated gonad. It's, you can't, when you take a look at the male or female, you can't tell the difference. And as a matter of fact, if you 
um, interfere with the genetic programming, you, you can get the male um, gonad to develop like a female gonad or the female gonad to, to develop similar to a male gonad. <coughs> And within that um, developing gonad, there's three precursor populations. The, um, there it is, the germ cell um, po um, population, the supporting cell precursors, and the sporadogenic cell precursor. And in the male, what happens is that a gene's turned on, known as the SRY gene, or sex-determining region on the Y chromosome, which uh, uh, drives maturation of the um, um, Sertoli cell. The Sertoli cell then um, releases a number of different factors, many of which are still un unidentified, which drive maturation of, of, of the other cells within the, the um, testis, including the steroidogenic precursor cell, which becomes the lytic cell. The, the Sertoli cell also releases malarian inhibiting substance with, that causes malarian duct regression, while the lytic cell produces the, the male hormone, testosterone, um, which then drives um, maturation and development of the male reproductive tract, including the development of the epididymis, the seminal vesicle, testicular descent, and testosterone in, um, is then metabolized to dihydrotestosterone in the external genitalia to de drive development of the penis and prostate. So you can see how chemicals or mutations which interfere with testosterone function can lead to um, a dramatic impact on male reproductive tract development. And the period that testosterone um, plays a major role in male reproductive tract development is during the fetal life in both rodents and most mammals and in humans as well. So um, for the, uh, the rat, it's during the late gestation period, from gestation day about um, 14 or 15 to about uh, 18 or 19, you get this peak in testosterone production. And then as the gestation is complete around day um, 20 or 21, you get a drop off in testosterone production that doesn't come up again uh, until um, puberty. And it's during that period of peak um, testosterone production that you get development of the male reproductive tract at the, um, at the late stage in the gestation of the, um, the rat. You see a similar surge of testosterone production in the, uh, uh, the human um, fetus uh, um, in the testis. Uh, and this happens in the human uh, about um, uh, early, oh, sorry, early to, to mid gestation. <coughs> we see this peak in testosterone production and then uh, a gradual decline as the fet fetus develops. But, but it's during that peak period that uh, you get male reproductive tract development. So you can see why uh, it's during the fetal period that we're, we're most concerned about uh, testosterone production and male reproductive tract development. And because a lot of what I'll be talking about today is what's going on in the fetus, uh, the fetal testis, I wanted to give you just a little orientation of what the fetal testis looks like it, uh, in, in the rat at this time. So um, these um, large cells with the large nuclei are the gonocytes, or um, the future germ cells. Um, um, and um, surrounding the, um, there we go, surrounding the, uh, uh, the germ cells are the Sertoli cells, which support and maintain germ cell um, proliferation and viability. And in between these, uh, and so these regions are known as the cords within the fetal testis. And in between these cords are the um, lytic cells, which are producing the testosterone. So the class of chemicals that we're focusing on today are the phthalate esters, which are used um, as, um, widely used as plasticizers, and they impart um, flexibility and um, strength to a variety of consumer goods. And they're used in a number of consumer goods, uh, including um, food packaging, um, toys, and personal care products. And as I mentioned, um, they have an anti-androgenic process, um, and they work, um, though, not by binding and blocking androgen receptor function, but, but through a different mechanism. <coughs> and as I mentioned, they produce a number of male reproductive um, defects, and this in, in this case, in the, ro in the rat studies that we've done, and you get cryptorchidism, um, which is undescended testis, um, male reproductive tract malformations, including epididymal malformation, hypospadias, and um, also um, separate from what you see with other antiandrogens, they also cause regions of apparent lytic cell hyperplasia, and you get these large um, multinucleated gonocytes and um, ab abnormal seminiferous cord formation. So one of the, the studies recently that was in the news that kind of um, brought um, phthalate research back into the, into the news is a study that was done out of Shauna Swan's laboratory. 
where she took a measurement that we use in rodent studies and applied it to humans. This is something that hasn't been done very often. And, in, and um, what she was measuring is the anal genital distance. Okay, so in, uh, this was first identified in rodent studies is that the anal genital distance is different between males and females. It's larger, uh, there's a larger distance in males. But if you block androgen function, you get a shorter distance, a more feminized uh, uh, distance. So um, that's one of the measures that we use in the laboratory to look at the, the effects of antiandrogens or measure the effect of antiandrogens on male reproductive development. Um, what Shauna did was take this measurement that we've been using in our phthalate studies and apply it to humans. Now, um, and, she, she was a, and what she did with that study is um, take a look at um, um, uh, the mothers and measure some of the phthalate levels that they, they um, showed during pregnancy and then measured the AGD of um, male infants um, after birth and tried to correlate phthalate exposure of the mothers to AGD in, in the humans. Now this was a groundbreaking study in that it took something that we've been doing in the, li in the laboratory and moved it into the, to the, to the human um, exposure um, or epidemiology. But um, there's several um, um, things we should remember with this study. It, it's, it's sort of an initial study. It's really a, it's, it's a start. It's something that really needs to be taken a look at in much more detail. Um, the me method for measuring AGD hasn't really been um, standardized for humans. Uh, and this was a rather small cohort of um, humans that she looked at. But it gives us a start to begin to take something that we do in the laboratory and apply it to humans as a way of to begin to, to, get an to, uh, to begin to start seeing what's going on in the human population and try to correlate chemical exposure with human development. So it's just a start. But it did what it did show is that there is a correlation, or there was in this study, for um, phthalate exposure and um, a shortened AGD. So it heightened concern that, that perhaps environmental levels of phthalate exposure may have an effect on human male reproductive development and sort of brought up greater concern. I know that her lab and multiple other labs now are trying to um, uh, further um, an the analysis and, and um, broaden the number of individuals, increase the, the, um, the significance of this study. So what we did in our laboratory then, um, we knew that, anti that phthalates were acting like an antiandrogen, but we knew that they were not blocking androgen receptor function. So what we were trying to do is take a genomics approach and understand the mechanism by which these antiandrogens produce this effect. And what we did was take a look at a, a um, panel of phthalate esters, some of which were known to be reproductive toxicants in rodents, and some of which were um, shown not to be reproductive to toxicants, at least at the doses used in the, in the laboratory. <coughs> so we took a look at um, several non-reproductive toxicants, including dimethyl and diethyl and dioxaterra phthalate, and several um, reproductive toxic um, phthalates, including dibutyl phthalate and benzobutyl phthalate, dipental phthalate, and diethyl ethyl. And in this slide, I'm just showing um, uh, st uh, the structures of several of the, of the uh, chemicals that we looked at to show you how similar they are in structure. So the um, DEHP and the DBP are reproductive toxicants in, in rats, whereas the DMP and the DEP are not. But you notice that there's quite, um, um, quite similar structure. There's just a um, slight variation in carbon chain lengths of the side chains that can make a difference as to whether these chemicals show up as reproductive toxicants in, in these studies or not. <coughs> So what, what we thought going into this study was that, that we would see some effects of gene expression just because we were giving high levels of phthalate exposure, whether it was toxic or not, and that we were trying to, to um, tease out what would be different between the non-toxic and the toxic phthalate. <coughs> so for this study, we treated um, pregnant rats with um, the different phthalate esters from gestation day uh, 12 to 19, 12 to 19, and then collected the male fetuses on gestation 19 and isolated the testis and snap froze them for measurements of, um, for gene expression measurements. Now remember, this period of gestation day um, 12 to 19 is, is the period of male reproductive tract development where we see that surge in testosterone production, which peaks at about 18 or 19, and then um, also the, this, this is the time period where you see the, the dramatic changes in male reproductive tract development. So um, after we isolated the fetal testes, we isolated the RNA and uh, used an um, affymetrix um, um, 
platform, wh which allowed us to look at approximately 30,000 different um, gene sets. And what we did, and then we um, we came up with approximately um, 391 genes that were significantly altered, which is really just a small percent of the total genes that we looked at. Of those 391 genes at that time, about 225 of them were, were unknown sequences, just transcribed sequences with no information. So there wasn't much we could do with them at that time. Um, but surprisingly, what we saw was with the um, phthalates that are non-reproductively toxic in um, rats, um, in, in all of the genes that we looked at, there was no significant differences in, uh, with those groups compared to each other or with control. So they had no significant effect at these doses on gene expression. Whereas the group that are known as um, reproductive um, rodent toxicants, um, they all were significantly different from control but they were not significantly different from each other. So they all seem to be have the uh, exact same gene profile. And this is just a, a heat map, which is, is one way to look at all of the different genes that we, that we were looking at and to give a way of, of, of showing the similarities and differences between the two groups. So I'll talk a little bit about what this is. Each of these columns represents one of our treatment groups, and here's our control. <coughs> and um, here's this group here represents those that are known as reproductive toxicants. Um, each of these um, lines on there represents a, a gene. And um, what we're trying to show with this um, heat map, and if it's red, that means that um, the gene expression is higher relative to a universal mean. What we did is average gene expression across all of the different um, uh, uh, um, arrays. And what you can see here, uh, amazingly, is that the um, non-reproductive toxicants had no effect on gene expression, that their gene profiles look identical to control, whereas the, um, the reproductive toxic um, phthalates looked almost identical in their gene expression um, um, profiles, and that they were dramatically different from control in that we see a large number of genes that are downregulated and very few that are upregulated. <coughs> so um, what we um, gather from this um, information I is that these reproductive toxicants have obviously have a dramatic effect on gene expression and that they're all working through a similar mechanism, producing similar effects on gene expression in the fetal testis. So we tried to, uh, of the known genes in that group, we tried to cluster them together to try to gain some information about what was going on in the fetal testis, what were these, what were these compounds doing. And um, as we clustered the genes, we see that um, one of our largest clusters, genes that are involved in lipid, cholesterol, and sterile homeostasis, and also as well, uh, steroidogenesis and lipid transport, and all of these groups were all downregulated in the phthalate group um, re relative to control. Um, <coughs> we also see some effects on transcription factors and oxidative stress, which is reduced. And then ag again, we have a large number of unclassified genes that we just don't know what they're doing, but they're, they show some alteration. So to get an understanding of what all that information means is we. They cannot hear me. I, I apologize. Um, I hope I'm not blocking anybody's view. So um, to try to put all of that information together as to what areas that phthalates are um, targeting, and um, this is uh, a, a, a cartoon de depicting steroidogenesis in the um, in the Leydig cell. And um, what you have is uh, in st steroidogenesis starts with cholesterol, which is either produced within the cell or is transported from outside the cell um, with cholesterol or lipid um, transporters. And, and in one case here, we're pointing out one uh, transporter, which is scavenger receptor type B1. So um, cholesterol is uh, transported across the mitochondrial membrane uh, with a protein called STAR, or steroid acute regulatory protein. Um, and then it's converted through a series of enzymatic steps from cholesterol through progesterone to testosterone. And it's this testosterone that then binds to the androgen receptor, and it's the activation of the androgen receptor that produces the um, effects associated with the male reproductive development. So what we see, what we see with um, DVP as well as other phthalate exposure is that this entire process is targeted and downregulated following phthalate exposure. We see a decrease. Oops, excuse me. We see a decrease in genes involved in cholesterol transport from across the cell membrane and we see a decrease in uh, genes involved in cholesterol synthesis, as well as um, a decrease in STAR, and a, a decrease in all of the genes involved in converting cholesterol to um, testosterone. 
So this demonstrates the mechanism by which these phthalate esters produce their antiangiogenic effect in the fetal, rat fetal testis is through a, a dramatic downregulation in the entire process of, con of um, producing cholesterol and converting it to testosterone. <coughs> We've also taken a look at um, dose response to try to get an understanding of what dose we, we see these effects in um, testosterone production. Um, most of our studies to, to uh, maximize our effect when looking for gene expression <coughs> occur, uh, occur, uh, have been done at um, 500 milligrams per kilogram per day over that dosing period that we talked about. And that's where we see our most dramatic change in, um, in uh, testosterone production in the fetal testis. But um, if from a, a dose response point of view, we begin to see significant changes at a dose at about 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. <coughs> and and this, is, this is measuring, in this case, um, fetal, fetal testicular testosterone. When we um, compare this effect on fetal testicular testosterone production with gene expression, we see the exact same gene and protein profile. So genes that we know that play a role in um, cholesterol homeostasis and steroidogenesis also show a, 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 a similar dose response curve where we see, begin to see significant effects at 50 and, and even more effects at, at 500 milligrams per kilogram. And it occurs both at the gene expression level and the protein level <coughs> for all of the ge um, genes that we've so far um, studied associated with steroidogenesis. And in this slide, I'm just trying to show you that one of the other things that we know occurs with um, phthalate esters, which is different from other antiangiogens, is we get these large, um, large multinucleated gonocytes or germ cells. And you can see in this one, they have at least four different nuclei in that cell. And this one over here, uh, at least three. And another one over here with, with three. So um, we're also in our laboratory focused on trying to understand this mechanism, what, what plays a role in this is probably not due to, to reduction in, in androgen signaling. We don't see it with other antiandrogens. <coughs> One of the interesting things about um, phthalates is that they also induce uh, cryptorchidism, uh, much like other antiandrogens, although we get a slightly different phenotype after phthalate exposure. <coughs> so um, during uh, rat and human uh, male reproductive tract development, the um, the gonad starts just like the ovary up in the, up in the um, interabdominal position, um, and then it must descend um, at the end of the fetal period down into the position within the scrotum. And this this process of, of um, descent of the testis is a is a, a two factors at least play a role in that. In the, in the initial stage of descent, um, it is driven by insulin-like free um, factor. And then the second, later stage of uh, um, scrotal descent is um, androgen mediated. So in the presence of chemicals that are antiandrogens or those that block the uh, ability of testosterone to interact with the androgen receptor, you get a, a cryptorchidism in where the, the testis is, um, is sort of s stopped in about the mid-range of descent. <coughs> After phthalate exposure, you get a slightly different um, phenotype for the cryptorchidism, and you get a slightly higher um, Gonad. And that's due to, um, we and other laboratories have shown that uh, after phthalate exposure, um, phthalates reduce insulin like three factor um, production. So you actually get a twofold effect on testicular descent, both reduction in insulin like three as well as a uh, reduction in testosterone production. So just to summarize what we've talked about before, um, so far, to try to get an understanding of the mechanism of, of um, effects that we're, we're seeing with um, phthalates is um, we're talking about primarily within the testes, even though there are other cell types, about three specific cell types that we've focused on so far. The first, I seem to have lost my pointer. There he is. Okay, the first is the fetal lytic cell, which is the steroidogenic producing cell. And the second is the Sertoli cell, which plays a role, which supports and helps um, drive gonocyte proliferation and survival. And the, and the third is the gonocyte, which is the um, germ cell precursor. There's actually another cell type that's becoming important within our studies, um, which is not shown in this picture, and that's the peritubular myoid cell, which is a smooth muscle-like cell, which um, um, forms on the cord around the Sertoli cell. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in my talk.
So as I, as I mentioned, um, the fetal lytic cell is our steroidogenic producing cell, um, which um, produces testosterone, which drives male reproductive tract development. In addition, it produces insulin like three, um, which plays a role in testicular descent, <coughs> and also reduces, produces factors which are involved in Sertoli cell development. And the Sertoli cell produces factors um, such as um, stem cell factor and fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor, which play a role in maintaining um, uh, germ cell survival. After phthalate, oops, excuse me, after phthalate exposure, what we see is a dramatic downregulation in genes uh, associated with lytic cell function, <coughs> which reduce testosterone, leading to malformed reproductive, um, male reproductive development, as well as a reduction in insulin like three, which um, um, plays a role in cryptorchidism, and uh, reduction in alpha inhibin, which may play a role in its effect on Sertoli cells. <coughs> and we see a reduction in Sertoli cell associated factors, including um, factors involved in gap junction formation and um, cellular signaling between the germ cells. So it seems that, that um, phthalates at this point have multiple cell cellular targets within the fetal testis. So this, um, all of this work to date has been, is, um, that I've presented has been um, where we've dosed the animals um, for multiple times, right? So we've multiple, from gestation day 12 to 19. So they've had multiple doses and we're really looking at a late stage effect of the phthalates. And what we wanted to try to do is um, understand what's, what's occurring initially after phthalate exposure, and hoping that that would give us an idea of, of how the phthalates begin to produce this uh, dramatic effect on the developing testes. So we took a look at the early gene changes in the, in the fetal testes, again, taking a genomics approach. So we used our, our high dose, again, to, to maximize changes in gene expression, and then we looked at gene expression changes um, very early on after um, um, exposure, and then, um, and then all, all the way out to 24 hours. So we looked at half an hour, one hour, three hours, all the way out to 24. And we did this exposure period between gestation days 18 and 19, that period of, of peak testosterone production, because what we're really focusing on at this point was what is the mechanism by which these compounds reduce testosterone production. And we measured um, testosterone production by the fetal testis as well as gene expression. And surprisingly, what we found was that um, when we looked at fetal testicular testosterone, we saw a reduction in testosterone production as early as as early as one hour after um, phthalate exposure. So this is a really rapid effect of phthalates uh, within one hour. Um, and then we see a further uh, reduction about, about six hours after um, phthalate exposure. Surprisingly, when, so that's the measuring the testosterone. When we looked at the genes that we know that play a key role in, um, in steroidogenesis, we don't begin to see a significant reduction in those genes until about six hours. So we see this um, early drop in testosterone production, about 50% of what we would see later on, and then a, a further drop at six hours, and at that same time is when we also see a reduction in, in steroidogenic gene expression. So we can't really explain what's going on at this early time point, but it's really at the, certainly at the later time point, at six hours and beyond, you see that reduction due to a reduction in the steroidogenic um, associated genes. And this is just another one of those heat maps which kind of give you an idea of what we're seeing within the initial period after phthalate exposure. So in this case, comparing control genes to, um, to phthalate at 1, 3, 6, and 18. And if you remember, we, we sort of normalized our gene expression for this heat map to a, to a universal control. So if it's green, it's down to that relative to that universal control. If it's red, it's up relative to that universal control. And if you also remember, if I showed you from the earlier heat map, that after long-term phthalate exposure, the majority of genes are down-regulated. But surprisingly, what we see here after phthalate exposure is as early as one hour after exposure, and certainly by three hours, we get this dramatic induction in gene expression <coughs> that um, peaks at three hours and then begins to drop at six hours and 18 hours. And it, again, at six hours is when we begin to see the reduction in genes associated with um, steroidogenesis, and they uh, stay down um, 18 hours after um, exposure. So we get this dramatic induction of non-steroidogenic related genes and then the steroidogenic genes uh, drop down later. And this is a, an example of some of those early initial genes that we see that show these peak expression. The expression can sometimes be up to 20-fold higher 
um, relative to control uh, in the phthalate exposed fetal testis. And it shows this dramatic increase, peaking sometimes at one hour, sometimes at three hours after exposure, and then a dramatic uh, drop in gene expression. And these are just some of the genes of that um, many genes that we saw. Um, CFOS, C gene, you may be familiar with some of these names, EGR1, e or which is early growth responder 1. Um, what this class of genes are, these genes that show this immediate dramatic increase and then dramatic reduction in expression, are known as a class of immediate early genes. So uh, immediate early genes are a class of genes that show this behavior of, of, peak, of early peak expression and a dramatic reduction. And they're induced through a, a, a number of different pathways, including induction of proliferation, apoptosis, um, um, cell division. There, there are a number of different factors that cause this dramatic induction of, of immediate early genes. So unfortunately, just looking at this class of genes right now doesn't give us an idea of the mechanism by which the phthalates are acting. They're inducing this immediate early gene response. And what we believe is that it then causes a cascade of events which ultimately lead to reduction in testosterone. But what we're trying to do now is understand how this, in, how this, ca this induction of immediate early genes begins that cascade of response. And we're um, beginning to focus now on the relationship of these genes that we're looking at with, with ultimately regulating steroidogenesis. So we move now from looking at uh, ge a genomics whole genome um, gene expression to try to get an understanding now of what's going on at some of the promoters of the genes that we know are dramatically downregulated by um, uh, phthalate esters. So uh, we began to take a, a promoter analysis approach where we looked, used multiple different techniques, including DNA footprinting, chromosome immunoprecipitation, uh, gel shifts or EMSAs and Western analysis to try to, I, to, try to take a look at the promoter regions of some of those genes that are regulated by phthalates to try to understand what's different in those genes relative to control. <coughs> so just to remind you of the, for, um, from some of the later show, slides that I'll be showing you, we, um, in our studies we had a control. We also um, used a negative control, which is diethyl phthalate, <coughs> which has no effect on testicular testosterone and uh, no effect on gene expression, and then two doses of, of phthalate, a 100 and 500 milligram per kilogram dose, which reduces testicular testosterone and also reduces gene expression of the genes that we'll be studying. Which the genes that we'll be talking about now for the promoter analysis are all showing coordinate regulation following phthalate exposure, and that's STAR, or steroid acute regulatory protein, scavenger receptor, or SRD1, and two cytochrome P450s, um, cytochrome P450 11A1 or side chain cleavage and CYP17. Now those genes show a, um, a, a reduction following DVP uh, treatment, but no change in gene expression following diethyl phthalate exposure. <coughs> so first we'll talk about an automated DNA footprinting um, um, method that my postdoc uh, Adam Cool de developed since he's been in my laboratory. And in DNA footprinting, what you do is um, um, do DNA's treatment, which uh, moves along the, the strand of DNA and chops it up um, um, into specific, um, at specific sites, and um, what you get is this ladder effect of the DNA as it's chopped up at, um, at specific um, sequences. Um, if there's a, a transcription factor bound to a, a specific sequence that you're a, um, studying at that point, it will prevent the DNAs from chewing up the DNA. And so then what you get is these sort of um, regions are holes, and that will t if you know the sequence that you're looking at at that region, then you can identify whether a transcription factor is bound there or not. And what um, um, Adam did is develop an automated sequencing process to look at this. And this is more of a qualitative approach and takes a little bit of a practice eye, but this is the type of readout you get, um, where he's looking at a known s um, stretch of DNA sequence on the promoter of, of one of these genes, um, after phthalate, after DVP treatment or DEP treatment and control, and then he compared the different DNA readout um, of those regions. And what, um, it takes a little practice, but what Adam was able to do is identify regions where you see a, um, changes relative to control. And in each of these three cases where he's circled, um, you get a dec the control um, lane is, is down relative to the treated um, region. And what that means is if, it's, if, you, if, if the peak is down, then that DNA is protected. So there's a transcription factor there that's not present after phthalate treatment. <coughs> so 
So the next step, has, after he identified those sequences, he thought by looking at those sequences, he knew what the transcription factor was. So then he did a, um, a gel shift with, a, um, with an, a specific antibody and showed that what was different at that region um, was, uh, in this case, this region represents SF1. So uh, in this region, that would suggest that SF1 is bound to the promoter of the, con of the control gene, but not bound to the phthalate-treated gene. And SF1 is known as steroidogenic factor 1, but it is known to play a key role in regulation of steroidogenesis. <coughs> he also showed that, um, that uh, in this region here, there is a um, decrease in binding in the phthalate-treated group of another transcription factor known as CEPB beta. <coughs> and um, then just to summarize, he, he then took, he took a next step. After he identified these, he wanted to use a different method to confirm it and get a more quantitative approach, so he used chromatin immunoprecipitation. And this is just a summary of all the different genes that he looked at and all the data that he compiled. <coughs> and um, in this first um, graph over here, what we're looking at is steroidogenic factor one. Remember I said that, that play, that's thought to play a key role in regulating of, um, steroidogenesis uh, in multiple cell types. And, and this is where he showed some surprising results, and I really pushed him on this, but it it's, it's reproducible, in that we see a reduction in SF1 binding after phthalate exposure, not only in with our um, reproductive toxicant phthalate, DEP, DDP, but also with um, DEP. So despite the fact that I showed you that we get no change in gene expression, SF1 transcription factor is reduced um, following this um, um, exposure to this non- rodent reproductive toxicant um, DEP. But when he looked at the other transcription factor that he identified, CEBP beta, <coughs> he showed that that is only reduced in the DVP treated group. So in the DEP group, there is no change in um, transcription factor binding, but in the DVP group, there is. <coughs> he looked at some other transcription factor that was also bound in that region, which is GATA4, and that was not changed. <coughs> And um, he looked at another transcription factor that which could bind to that region, SP1. And um, he, s he sees a, actually an increase in binding of SP1 to this region, especially within the DEP group. So that's led um, us to propose a, a hypothesis for how the, th how the phthalates are acting. So what we believe on, this, um, uh, on these promoters that we're looking at is that we have um, very in very close proximity two, at least two transcription factors, steroidogenic factor one and CEBP beta, which are probably working in concert to drive steroidogenic gene expression. <coughs> After exposure to diethyl phthalate, we get a loss of SF1 to the promoter region. But SF1 is replaced by SP1 which can then still maintain transcription of that gene in the presence of diethyl phthalate. But what happens in the presence of um, DBP is we get actually get a loss of both CEBP beta and SF1, and that leads to loss of transcription of that gene. <coughs> so what we're working on now is a hypothesis to try to explain how the binding of these different, how phthalates can alter the binding of the tran these transcription factors, and that's what Hopefully, Adam's working in the lab today on. <laughs> so now I want to talk a little bit about some of our um, newer studies that we've done recently that were really surprising and, and, um, and have given us some great models to work with. <coughs> it's been known for a while now that the mouse is less sensitive to the effect of phthalates than the rat is. And we had uh, um, scientists at, at our institute who tried heroically to try to reproduce in the mouse what we saw in the rat. So he used multiple doses of, hmm? Uh, multiple strains. So we tried different strains of mouse and we tried different phthalates. We tried different doses of phthalates and different treatment schedules um, to try to get an effect on steroidogenesis in the mouse. And we were not able to reproduce that effect. So the first thought was, well, maybe there's a difference in the pharmacokinetics. Maybe the phthalates aren't getting to the fetal testis of the mouse like they do in the rat. So we did a, 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 a sort of an abbreviated pharmacokinetic study just to find out if it's getting there or not. And what we see in this graph, um, comparing the e either looking at the maternal plasma for um, 
phthalates or in the fetal plasma. And in this case, we're looking for MVP, which is the metabolite of um, DVP and what we believe is the active metabolite that produces the toxic effects. And we're comparing um, the rat and the mouse. And what we see, we have a lot more data with the rat. So th what we see is that after phthalate exposure in the, in the mother, you get this um, peak in MVP, which is then um, slowly reduced over 12 hours. And if you look at fetal plasma, you get the same thing. You get this early peak, which is then reduced over 12 hours. When we looked in the mouse, we see that we get, um, even though we have more limited data, we see we get this exact same peak, which then drops down. So, um, so um, DVP is being metabolized in, in the mother, and it does reach the mouse fetal testes at levels that are either equal to or higher than what we see in the rat. <coughs> so that, answered the qu that helps us understand we know at least then that the phthalates are getting to the fetal testes, but they're not producing the same effect. And when we took it at a genomic-wide gene expression analysis in the mouse, um, we saw that very few of the genes that are involved in steroidogenesis um, in the rat are targeted um, in the mouse. And of the few genes that were altered in expression, rather than going um, down like we see in the rat, they're actually increased. So the, the, the whole process of steroidogenesis is not targeted in the rat. So the phthalates are getting there, but they're not targeting steroidogenesis. Um, what, what we did see is that we still, we do see uh, an increase in the immediate early gene expression. So we still see that induction of immediate early gene expression, which I don't present here, um, and then the rapid reduction. So that's um, actually causes a, um, originally we thought that perhaps the er immediate early gene expression played some role in the steroidogenesis, but we still see that in the mouse. So we're still trying to uh, get an understanding of, of what that immediate early gene response is. <coughs> so uh, another scientist, Dr. Kim Buckelhide, uh, who also collaborates with us, had suggested, he said, well, so you're not seeing a change in steroidogenesis. Do you get any of the other effects that are associated with phthalate exposure, such as multinucleated gonocytes, which we hadn't looked at? So we went back and looked at that. <coughs> and what we see is um, with phthalate exposure in the mouse, we still get an effect of phthalates on uh, seminiferous cord um, formation. It causes a disruption of that disruption of that formation, so you get much wider cords. And within those cords, we see an increase in multinucleated gonocytes per cord and the number of multinucleated gonocytes, um, uh, nuclei per multinucleated gonocyte. So what we've been able to do here now with this study is we can separate the two effects of phthalates. There is in the rat, we get an effect on testosterone production and on germ cells and um, um, cord formation. In the mouse, there is no effect on steroidogenesis, but we, get, we still get this effect on uh, multinucleated gonocyte formation and cord formation. So it's a, it gives us a powerful model now to separate out these two different effects of phthalates and begin to understand what key genes are involved and what processes are involved in steroidogenesis relative to um, uh, cord formation and multinucleated gonocyte formation. So in summary of the data that I presented to you today, <coughs> what we have is uh, after phthalate exposure in both the rat and the mouse, we get this immediate early gene expression, which may or may not have anything to do with the, some of these later effects that we're talking about. Um, in, in the rat, you get an effect on both the lytic cell and the Sertoli cell. In the lytic cell, you get, a, you get a reduction in genes involved in steroidogenesis and um, production of insulin-like 3, which plays a role in, in um, testicular descent. And in the mouse, you only get an effect on what apparently, apparently on the Sertoli cell uh, germ cell function, which plays a role in cord uh, formation and multinucleated uh, gonocyte formation. So we're now beginning to look at the genes that we, we know that are different between the rat and the mouse and those that are the same and begin to understand what role these genes play in these two processes. So one of the things that I don't show you is that with the immediate early gene expression, uh, one of the things that um, we, we've identified is that some of the most early gene expression changes that we see occur in the peritubular myoid cell. So within um, the um, hours after phthalate exposure, the peritubular myoid cell is also showing a response. And that's a cell that we have very little understanding of what's it, what it's doing in, in its role in the um, testicular development. And we're beginning to focus in on the peritubular myoid cell as well. So just to go back to, to this slide for a minute. So what we have now is two different models of um, uh, the, of response, one where we see a, an effect on testosterone and one where we don't. So one of the questions we have is how do we determine whether this effect on testosterone is intrinsic to the fetal testis or whether it's something external. 
And so what we're beginning in a very preliminary series of experiments is actually doing xenotransplant. You can take a fetal testis and transplant it into um, the kidney capsule. And you can do that, so you can transplant a um, syngenaic, either rat to rat, or you can do mouse to rat, and then rat to mouse. By doing those studies, uh, what we want to, then we'll expose those animals to phthalates. What we want to find out is do, when we transplant a fetal mouse testis to a rat, or a rat to a mouse, what type of response do we get? Do we get the response that we would expect to see um, with the mouse testis in the rat, or do we get a rat response? And that will help us understand whether we should be focusing on something that's intrinsic to the testis or external. And we've only got preliminary studies to show that when we do transplant the fetal testis and treat with, with phthalates, we do get the expected, in the rat, reduction in testosterone. So we know that we can do this process and make it work. And now we're beginning to extend those studies to allow us to do species comparison for um, a mechanism of response. So in summary, what we've started with is uh, um, something of no human concern, which is testicular dis dysgenesis or impact on male re human reproductive development. We identified an animal model <coughs> and then used a, a high-throughput genomics approach to get an understanding of the mechanisms of actions of these chemicals. We then did a number of follow-up studies, which included dose response, time course, pharmacokinetics, and species comparison to try to get further understanding of mechanism. And all of this is then coming together um, using a, a systems biology approach to understand testicular dysgenesis and hopefully give us a better understanding of what's going on in the human population. And this is just a reminder that what we're focusing on is the effect of the effect of phthalates on testosterone production. So, um, but there are other methods to interfere with testosterone function, including the antiandrogens, as I mentioned, or genetic approaches, such as androgen receptor mutations. And all of those can feed in to decrease androgen activity at the target tissue, which is in this case is male reproductive tract development. So this is just a slide to, to, to illustrate that there are more than one way to get to that impact on male reproductive tract development. I think I've lost control. Yes. <laughs> so I just want to acknowledge all the, the, the number of scientists who have um, played a role in this, these studies over the years. It's been a, it's been a large group, and, and they've um, really helped drive the science. And that includes um, Dr. Paul Foster, who's now at the NIHS, who really got me started in this, as well as some of my current collaborators, including uh, Cameron Johnson and uh, Kim Burkhardt at Brown University. And this work has been um, funded not only through the ACC or the American Chemistry Council, but also th um, through the NIH through um, um, available grants as well as the EPA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, now we have time for questions. For people who are watching webcasting, you can send me your comments, question to my email. Uh, when you look at uh, the gene expression profiles, I gather that you look at all the cell types, mm -hmm. uh, including Sertoli, the lading, and uh, the germ cells, correct? We're, when we look at gene expression currently, we're looking at total testicular gene expression, so it includes all cell types. Okay. Now, uh, I'm curious to, to find out uh, 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 at this uh, development stage, uh, whether the pituitary or the hypothalamus might also be involved, and as such, have you looked at those uh, cell type uh, in terms of the, their gene expression profiles? In, in general, it's thought that, that they are not involved at this time because there's no measurable levels of hormones. So we have not looked at those tissues. Uh, the, the, the prevailing thought is that this early stage of, of steroidogenesis in the fetal testicular in the in the fetal testes is um, either is a local phenomenon not having to do with the HPT axis uh, 
Um, based on the limited data that uh, is th that are available for humans, how do you think humans respond closer to rat response to phthalates or to mice? It's my first question. My second question is, in one of your early slides on the development of the male reproductive tract, you had a um, heading external genitalia and then you listed penis, scrotum, prostate. Why is prostate considered uh, external genitalia? Um, it wouldn't be considered external genitalia. That's a, that's, that would be an incorrect label. It is considered an external tissue. So in, in, in most cases, for testosterone to impact an external tissue, that tissue converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, is sort of a, um, to increase the potency in a response. So it's a, it's a DHT, it's a dihydrotestosterone-driven tissue that's more external to the testis. So it's it was incorrect the way that's labeled. I apologize. Yes. Uh, and your, se your first question was whether I thought humans were more like rats and mice, because I don't know. So um, I think that's one of the things that we hope to find out. Um, for most, it, it, to my understanding, for most male reproductive toxicants, the rat has been a better model. So um, you would expect that the rat, that the human may be more like the rat. However, uh, we, we don't know with phthalates yet. And, um, that's actually one of the things that we hope to be able to do with our transplant model is to carry it on into humans and see if we can do that and find that out. Thanks. Uh, just uh, one comment probably about the uh, difference between humans and rats in stereogenesis. Uh, most likely humans like a pathway that's known as the Delta-5 pathway in stereogenesis versus the Delta-4 that you show for the rodents. That will give you a good difference right there in the model. And uh, in the same token, we are, if we are looking for effect on uh, stereogenesis, in particular enzyme, I will concentrate on the one known as the rate limiter of the pathway. Uh, in humans, I believe, uh, with several studies, uh, for at least in the females, is 17 hydroxylase, CYP17. <coughs> in, the, in the rats, I don't know. Uh, so probably you can uh, uh, fine tune in your uh, data in terms of uh, which genes uh, up or down regulating, just searching for those genes that are directly to the right limiting step on the stereogenesis. Thank you. I think that, that, that actually there, there are several different rate limiting steps. There's the um, star plays a role in, in, in getting um, cholesterol across the mitochondrial membrane. So it's thought to play a rate limiting role in stereogenesis. Um, but certainly it would be helpful to focus in, you're right, to focus in on those genes and, or proteins that are known to be rate limiting control factors. Because those are going to be the key changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions um, sent in from our uh, webcast viewers. This is from uh, Dr. George Alex Ayeth, who's our Deputy Director for Scientific Affairs, who's in the Oakland office today. Uh, he sent in two questions. The first one is, can gene expression be used as a so-called adverse effect to establish a safe level for substances such as DBT? I'd be hesitant to do that, because I think we can see gene expression changes prior to changes in protein or response. And I, I don't think we have enough information or evidence to suggest that a, that a gene expression change can, can be indicative of an adverse response. And second question is, has gene expression been ev evaluated in human cells? If so, is there a difference in sensitivity between humans and rodents? I'm a little confused with that question. I'll, I'll, I'll assume that the question means with phthalates in testicular cells? Yeah. Yeah, I would assume so too. Because in general, I mean, that's a pretty general question. So we'll stick with phthalates in testicular cells. We don't have a good in vitro model for doing that with humans, and we certainly can't do it as an in vivo model. So there's not a way to compare sensitivity of response to, um, to phthalate to exposure in the, in the testis at this time. Uh, 
Oh, that was very nice. That, uh, in particular, I really like your promoter analysis that you were doing there, and and, and how that you showed that that um, um, DEHP or, or uh, a DP, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, DBP right. or, mm -hmm. or DEP uh, blocked SF1, but but yet it could recover by a, an alternate, uh, you know, transcription factor. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering. If we think about toxicological responses, how many more of these we're going to see? Uh, where the, but, but because you can have multiple transcription factors that there need to, to, to establish an initiation complex, how many we're going to see, and how genetically complex this is going to be in terms of the regulation of these transcriptional controls? I, I think you do point out it's going to be it's extremely complicated, and there. And there uh, we have to start looking first before we know how many they're going to be. This certainly caught me by surprise, and I, yeah. and I made my postdoc go back and do it multiple times because I didn't believe him, but it's a reproducible response in our system that we're working with. So That's nice. Yeah, thanks. What we, you know, just getting back to that question, what we need to do, we ha that was all done in rats. What we need to do now is carry that onto mouse and see what's going on with those same transcription factors in the promoters with the mouse, and we haven't done that work yet. And we, <coughs> excuse me, we have a question from Dr. Lauren Zeiss in our Oakland office. If you were to give a, a phthalate that has, that's untested in vivo, could you predict whether or not it would be a rat male reproductive uh, toxicant based on gene expression pattern? Um, possibly. I, th I think I would have to know a little bit more about its metabolism and its metabolic and its pharmacokinetics because those could also impact as to whether it can get to the fetal testis or not. So, um, so I, th I think if we knew that it w could be that its met metabolic profile was similar to the ones that we've looked at and that it can get to the fetal testis, then um, if, if, those, if the gene expression patterns match those two different ones that, we, that I showed up there, either no effect or an effect, then yeah, you could probably make a good, pr I think you should be able to make a good prediction. Okay, wonderful talk. I have two questions. Uh, one is your uh, hypothesis, SF1 plus C, IED beta, right? Mm -hmm. DEP, diethylphthalate is not a known male reprotoxicant, but uh, it still uh, reduces the SS, SF1. In theory, if you have DEP plus uh, DBP, the cumulatively, can DEP amplify the effect of DBP? Because both of them target SF1. The, the, I mean, DEP doesn't target the other gene, but it does target one of the two. So in theory, could it amplify the effect of DBP cumulative? That's my first one. Okay. Yeah. The second one is, um, we know what uh, the long-term consequence of effect on Sertoli cells. We also know that for lytic cells, but how about those uh, giant multinucleate gonocytes? Do we know the long-term effect of those cells that change? Thank you. So your first question, I think it's an interesting one, and I think that's the type of experiment that needs to be done based on the results that we have. Um, um, you would think, in theory, that if you put the two together, you might get an amplification of an effect, you would think. But um, I think that really is something that somebody needs to take a look at, really, before going too much further with that. And it's, some, and it's an experiment I, I want to do and I think should be done, if not by me, hopefully by somebody. The second question um, was, I forget. The multinucleate. The multinucleate, what happens to the, so the long-term effect of the multinucleate um, cells, to our knowledge, is they disappear after uh, five to seven days postnatally. Um, probably through apoptosis. So, uh, if if um, any remain around in later stages of adult life, they they can't be identified. They're not seen. This is a, a kind of a, a different question in this regard. Um, 
and was, I was involved with some, some, some studies looking at a strain difference in, in, in induction of steroidogenesis. It, it, was, it was, you know, between strains of mice, and I realize you haven't done this comparison here, but, but there was major differences in, 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 in induction of, of um, uh, CYP17 and also in, 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 in aromatase. And um, one of the things that, that is, is very different about these, uh, some of these strains is that, uh, um, you must say that, that some of them actually map to, to the region of SF1. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if, if we start to think about the broader picture here, okay, of, of thinking about individual variation uh, within humans and, and, and different uh, across species as well. Um, if we can, can start to think a, a little wider in terms of, of how the variations in, in some of these genes, whether it be SS1 or CYP17 or whatever, could affect response to these toxicological stimuli. I actually think you're, you're right. And that is something that as we begin to identify these transcriptional mm -hmm. targets and the targets of these uh, environmental chemicals or, or other stressors, um, we need to get an understanding of the genetic variation that, cause, that may cause a change in response to those um, stressors or chemicals. Yeah. Any other questions from the room or from cyberspace? Okay, well, I, I think that ends our uh, presentation. So I'd, I'd like to again thank Dr. Guido for coming out here from North Carolina. This is again a really relevant, interesting presentation. And um, I guess you'll maybe be here, you'll maybe be here for a few minutes if, if someone wants to follow up and talk. So thank you again. Our next present. <laughs> and 